There isn't too much to analyse in the next few cutscenes, but if you've come this far, I assume you're interested in the story, so I'll leave them in. You're awake. Oh, thank God. It wasn't easy getting you back here by myself, you know. You collapsed on the roof. I collapsed? No, I... Wait. Does that mean... You... You must have gotten yourself infected somehow. The time between infection and zombification differs greatly from person to person. You're lucky, Frank. You seem to have a very high level of resistance. So, uh... <laughs> so what you're saying is that I get to spend longer waiting for the inevitable, is that it? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure lucky is the word I'd use. <sighs> he who fights monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. And that's probably the only time you'll hear me quote Nietzsche in my videos. The helicopter crashed. No one's coming to help us now. It's over for us, no matter what we do. <sighs> what if... What if there was some way to impede the infection? extract and administer a large dose of hormones from the corpus alatum of an adult queen, it would potentially hinder the growth of the larva in your blood, retarding the zombification process. Hang on a sec. I don't understand a word you just said. What are we supposed to do? I'll need certain supplies to get this to work. And queens, as many as you can get your hands on. <sighs> Sounds like a plan. Should be sitting around here waiting to die. <sighs> Overtime mode will take us through to the cheer ending, and Frank's imminent zombification is our new deadline, so you only have 24 hours to collect what Isabella needs. In case you thought that would be easy, the special forces have returned to occupy the mall.
interesting of the game to predict our current dystopian future where we have to hide in the shadows to avoid the eyes of military kill drones. Their guns aren't up to much, but if you get spotted, all the nearby speckles will make a beeline for you. And without any zombies to distract them, they're even more irritating than usual. The stealth mechanic is pretty half-baked, so it's usually better to just shoot the drones and run for it if there are too many jarheads to handle. The next few hours are just a trek through the mall to collect various items for Isabella while surviving the military, and by now you should have no trouble making your way around to find everything. Since I'm running out of outfits to wear, this seems like the perfect time to mention something I forgot until now, the game's cross-dressing options. Yes, as if Frank isn't being punished enough, there are seven dresses and skirts in the game, which is actually more than there are suits, and our hero looks terrible in all of them. Then again, Dead Rising is all about freedom, so it's up to you if you want to play as a raging drag queen and massacre the army with your handbag. Sadly, there aren't any women's shoes, so I guess Capcom decided that fighting zombies while wearing high heels would just be too silly for this game. I hesitate to call this an early example of transgender issues in games, since these are clearly here just for the joke, just like the children's clothes. But hey, Frank doesn't seem to mind wearing them that much, so what do I know? I think if it were me, I would at least shave my legs, though. It shouldn't take long to get everything together, and it's soon time to return to the hideout. So, this drug that stops the parasite growth. Have you ever made it before, or is it just a theory? When I was working in the medical lab, my brother asked me to research a method of suppressing the parasite. Of course, back then, we didn't extract the hormones directly. We synthesized them in the lab. <laughs> so, he was looking to protect himself from his own terrorist scheme. He wanted a way out, is that it? I don't know. I know he didn't bring the drug with him here. I have no idea what he intended to use it for. You think I'm just making excuses, but Carlito kept things from me. <laughs> Even if this, uh... Even if you do manage to make this drug, it won't completely cure me, will it? I'm afraid not. When the effect wears off, the parasite will develop as it normally would, continuing the zombification process. That lot of good that does me. This is all I need as far as supplies are concerned. Now all we need are some queens. Yeah, uh... Listen. Just how long do you suppose your drug will prevent me from turning into a walking corpse? During my research, I was never able to conduct proper clinical studies. To a certain extent, the period of effectiveness depends on each patient's physiology. It could be a year. Maybe only a week. There's no way to tell for sure. Fantastic. So, I'll be a walking zombie time bomb. A time bomb? What? Once the drug's development was complete, Carlito poured his energy into starting an NPO dedicated to helping war orphans. We had 50 doses of the drug prepared. Not long after that, the NPO managed to find homes for a large group of children. Want to guess just how many?
you saying he infected these kids and then gave them your drug? That he made 50 little ticking time bombs? I don't know. I just don't know. It is possible, though. Look at this. New York, D.C., L.A. These kids are spread all over the country. If your theory is right, the entire country could be crawling with zombies by now. Shit, I don't know what's worse. That we don't know for sure, that we can't warn anyone about this. Well, what we need to do right now is prepare the hormone and get you taken care of. Frank's ongoing infection means that he's doomed to take Isabella's drug regularly for the rest of his life, thereby making it the perfect consumer product. Indeed, this idea is developed more in Dead Rising 2, where the formula becomes the corporate-owned Zombrex, and that game, as well as the Road to Fortune spin-off comic, explore how far that Phenotrans will go to continue profiting from the drug. Of course, this draws inspiration from the idea that a treatment is more profitable than a cure, as seen with the widespread distrust of and paranoia about Big Pharma. Some of these complaints are no doubt valid, but it's difficult to know at what point anti-capitalism bleeds into reactionary hippie nature worship Ludditism. After all, SSRIs were a huge cash cow for pharmaceutical companies, but that doesn't mean they haven't been demonstrated to have an effect on depression. A more in-depth look at this concept is also featured in the puzzle-slash-simulation game Big Pharma, which we'll cover at some point. To shift topics, it does seem quite ironic that the US is simultaneously the country that destroyed Santa Cabeza and the one that took in Carlito's orphans, but it's perhaps emblematic of the real-world confusion of US foreign policy. Liberals raise hell about the treatment of Muslim refugees but ignore the American atrocities that caused their homes to be destabilised in the first place. out of here I doubt these zombies would just let us walk right through of course the idea of brown-skinned refugee children as little ticking time bombs is also fitting given the current alt-right hysteria about the destruction of western values secularism the white race and so on and so on through demographic change but I don't think that implication is in the original game especially since the list we saw is mostly made up of white sounding names However, the orphans are retconned in Dead Rising 3 to right. have all been from Santa Gabeza to tie in an extra political message about immigration and Hispanics in the US, and I think that's the more interesting plot anyway, so I'll just pretend that's canon here. Since we already talked about Carlito's motivations though, I'll move on. The hole in the clock tower allows the zombies to slowly repopulate the mall, and I suppose that's a good thing too, because otherwise we wouldn't have anywhere to get the queens that Isabella needs from. As the zombies spread out again, it takes a few game hours to hunt down the stretching zombies which carry the wasps and recover the ten needed for the formula. You're gonna inject me with that, huh? Okay, Doc. Let's get this over with. <sighs> At least I won't have to worry about turning into one of them for a while. Okay, next on the agenda, figure out a way to get the hell out of here. While I was isolating the hormone, I managed to identify a pheromone that suppresses the attack instinct in adult parasites. In other words, the zombies don't like the way it smells. If you give me a little more time, I should be able to produce some of this pheromone. They think it smells bad? You think we could use something like that to keep them away from us? We could just walk right past them and get out of here. 
In theory, yes. Either way, it's certainly better than nothing. There was a cave. Outside, where the helicopter crashed. It was packed with zombies, I mean shoulder to shoulder. But it may lead somewhere outside. If it works, your anti-zombie perfume, it could keep us safe in that cave. What do you say? You ready to get the hell out of here? There won't be enough of this pheromone to waste it on experiments. We'll only have enough to use it once. Whatever you say. I don't know, but considering how many of them keep pouring out of here, it must be connected to something. Isabella, look. Any other way out of here is guarded by the military. If we're gonna get out of here and put a stop to Carlito's plan, we've got to go in there. It's the only way. It's not like we're unarmed. We got your smelly perfume, don't we? <sighs> I wouldn't be alive right now if your shot hadn't worked. The perfume's gonna work too. I know it. All right. Let's go. Yeah. And so, with that stirring pep talk, we're off, and there's no more free roaming as we reach the final stretch of the game. Make sure you grab some decent weapons and have full health before you give the last queen to Isabella, because there's no items down here but rocks. Unfortunately, the Horde isn't really our biggest enemy here, but the seriously wonky holding hands mechanic, which means you constantly get detached from Isabella and more importantly from the zombie repellent. Holding hands has been incredibly awkward for any of the survivors we've had to do it with until now, and it's no different here. If anything, it's worse with the uneven ground. Nonetheless, this is a neat little section and definitely makes you feel like you're entering the belly of the beast. Are you sure this was a good idea? Guards here too. If we can get that gate open, they'll be too busy dealing with zombies to notice us slip by. Wait! The pheromone is starting to wear off. It's only strong enough to cover one of us. What are you... What All right, are you hang doing? on tight, okay? Once we're out, let's see if we can't steal ourselves that set of wheels. Thank God the pheromone is starting to wear off, because carrying Isabella works a lot better than trying to drag her along. It's just a short run up to the lever, and while setting the zombies on the army and letting them out of the quarantine zone seems a bit cold-blooded, there's not much choice other than to do it and make a run for the Humvee and safety. But, of course, nothing's ever quite that easy. To put it another way, this battle is seriously easy, and I'll do it here without losing any health, but it's just a really lame turret segment against one slow moving target that takes ages. I'll play it sped up for the sake of your sanity. The bam 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 of the machine gun really drives you crazy after a while. I appreciate the developers trying to add some variety, but as always when a game switches genres for just one short section, you can't really devote enough development time to make it fully formed. Also, I just realised this is the only part in the whole game in any mode where you don't play as Frank, since Isabella is the one on the turret. I don't know, I thought it was interesting. The 
These automated machines are no use at all on the battlefield. Switch to manual control. Oh, it's this guy again. That on the battlefield quote reminds me so much of Metal Gear Solid for some reason. Men mopped up the mall. On a mission in which the number of targets is unclear, it's difficult to ensure absolute thoroughness. Huh. You have imagination. That's what drives you in your quest to run, your quest to hide. As prey, you and your kind are much more stubborn than the zombies. How much do you know about the zombies? I commanded the Santa Cabeza cleanup operation. If we had fulfilled our mission then, we wouldn't be needed here now to take care of this... incident. That's all it was to you, huh? A mission. What about those innocent people who had to pay for sins committed by our government our and its inhuman research? Our mistakes have not begun with this operation. <laughs> Humanity has proven itself to be quite adept at making mistakes. Ha! Hell! It's the only thing we truly excel at. Well then, I'd say this mission isn't quite over yet. Don't you agree? is here to serve as our final boss, and while it might seem a bit cheap to use someone we've never met before, the revelation of his backstory means he serves to complete the symbolism of our cast of metaphors. Just as Carlito represents terrorism and Dr. Barnaby represents the cruelty of the drives of capitalist overconsumption, Brock is here to put human face onto the inhuman forces of neoconservative American imperialism. While you can interpret his personality as one of those cliché evil bad guys I talked about earlier, whose only motivation is some half-fought critique of humanity as a whole and a celebration of naked power, I think he makes an interesting study of the philosophy of American military force. Brock doesn't really see his actions in terms of right and wrong, he only does what he's told and enjoys the work. He's a tool of the US war machine, but a willing one who finds his purpose there. In a way, he's the counterpoint to the Vietnam veteran Cliff, and rather being haunted by war, is comforted by it. He is the hammer in search of a nail, much like the neocon warhawks in the top levels of the American political and military hierarchy. His pessimistic view of humanity informs his belief that solutions are always measured in terms of bullets and bombs. Brock's heavy-handed and indiscriminate approach in Santa Cabeza is the cause of the Willamette incident, but instead of accepting the blame, he believes that only more violence could have achieved a favourable result, much like the right-wing ideologues who believe that we could have won in Vietnam or Iraq if only the cowardly politicians hadn't cut and run and betrayed our military by pulling out. 
Even though the application of brutality alone can never win hearts and minds, those like Brock believe that they are simply acting rationally in accordance with real politic, to pursue power and achieve America's goals at any cost, without worries about ethics or past mistakes that can only cost wars. However, their so-called pragmatism is itself an ideology that they are left blind by. In taking this nihilistic and reductive approach towards so-called human nature, they're setting up a self-fulfilling prophecy and in fact defining mankind as an ignorant and brutish species. In the fanatical pursuit of the interests of the American elite, the stated goal of defending America is forfeit. Brock got what he wanted from the Santa Cabeza incident and from the Willamette operation, so he isn't concerned with the fact that his actions make America less safe and not more safe. It's difficult to know to what extent the naked psychopathy of Brock informs the real logic of neoconservatism and how much American politicians and military leaders may actually believe they're doing the right thing, but the end result is largely indistinguishable. I'm reminded of an interview between Donald Trump and Bill O'Reilly where we get a rare glimpse of the truth behind Warhawk ideology rather than the patriotic veneer. Trump. I do respect Putin. Will I get along with him? I have no idea. It's very possible I won't. O'Reilly interjects, he's a killer though, Putin's a killer. There are a lot of killers, Trump replies. We've got a lot of killers. What, do you think our country's so innocent? Fitting with the Spartan ideology of his speech, the battle with Brock is conducted as ritualistic man-on-man -man unarmed combat. Honestly, I think it doesn't really fit with the tempo of the rest of the game and it consists mostly of running around him while trying to get an opening to launch one of your special moves. The double lariat in particular, the move where Frank spins around, ends the battle quickly and without much effort, but I try to avoid that. I think a more varied battle would have been nicer, but it gets the point across about Brock. Bloodthirsty to the end, he's still smiling as the horde devours him. Frank West managed to escape the town of Willamette with information pertinent to the incident under his belt. The news caused a fervor throughout the world, leading the US government to admit at least partial culpability in the livestock research program. However, no connection to the Willamette incident was acknowledged and events that occurred there were deemed the work of a fringe terrorist group. The people of the world, as could be expected from the modern culture of news saturation, soon let the Willamette incident fade from their minds. The authenticity of Carlito's chilling plan to utilise the orphans as his pawns has yet to be confirmed or proven false. And yet he complained that his belly was not full. I find the idea that the news cycle and popular consciousness would just move on from a zombie attack to be pretty hilarious, but in a satire it works and really, it's true to say that even if the Willamette incident did happen, it wouldn't stop the next Star Wars movie from coming out, Americans from eating burgers, or people tweeting about the latest dumb thing that Trump said. The tear ending is the only one in which Frank escaped with the full story of the outbreak, but in the end it hardly even mattered. There are a few consequences for those responsible besides the ones Frank, Brad and Carlito inflicted in Willamette, and the true implications of his report are ignored, with the government spin machine in full swing. As we see in Dead Rising 2 and beyond, zombie outbreaks continue across the US, and corporations and the government continue to exploit them for their own reasons. You could call it a downer ending, and in a way it is, but I find it to be much more witty than the cliché where everybody but the monster dies at the end. While most games tell us that the heroism of one man can change the world, Dead Rising posits that maybe it can't, and it's the responsibility of the public at large to right the wrongs of society. 
Frank does everything right, does everything that only a tiny minority of journalists ever do by cutting through the mainstream narrative, and fails anyway due to the apathy and short-sightedness of the media and media consumers. Dead Rising was actually part of the reason I became interested in pursuing a degree in journalism, ridiculous as that sounds, but perhaps I should have paid more attention to this ending. As much as I enjoyed Drea's Justified on the soundtrack here, perhaps a better choice would have been Dirty Laundry by Don Henley. This gloriously cynical ending is a perfect wrap-up to the themes of the story as a whole, and the cherry on top of the full force assault on American values. We've covered consumerism, law and order, the news, terrorism, guns, sex, class, freedom, imperialism, greed and meat-eating among others. I won't waste time by repeating all the points I've made in the last two and a half hours, but I hope people can understand why I wanted to cover this game now, and I'm curious what others made of it. If you had a different take on the material, I'd be interested to hear about it in the comments. One point that created a lot of forum posts in 2006 was the end of the text crawl. The text in red is an excerpt from an English nursery rhyme, which is certainly a cliché for a horror story, but let's look at it anyway. Robin the Bobbin, the big bellied Ben, he ate more meat than fourscore men. He ate a cow, he ate a calf, he ate a butcher and a half. He ate a church, he ate a steeple, he ate the priest and all the people. A cow and a calf, an ox and a half, a church and a steeple, and all the good people. And yet he complained that his belly was not yet full. This rhyme goes back to at least 1897, but it's easy to see how it can be applied to the modern zombie narrative. It could apply to Frank personally, of course, with the parasite strain still in his blood. It could be foreshadowing for how the US government and corporations will continue to use the zombies for their own profit. But most of all, of course, it brings to mind a crowd of all-consuming monsters that eat everything in their path without stopping for breath. And whether that applies to the living dead or Black Friday shoppers is up to you. As you can see in the background, the desire to render huge crowds of zombies for the first time in game is part of the reason for this game's creation, and while the developers are rightfully proud of this, I feel that Dead Rising became much more than the sum of its parts. I know some people were unhappy with me devoting so much time to one game though, which I understand, so for my next few videos I'll be covering some much more obscure and smaller scale leftist titles. But for now, thank you for the great ride Capcom. And so we finally get to the real end of the game. We're done, right? Well, there are still a few things I wanted to say before getting to final scoring, so bear with me just a little while longer. I think this is probably the most obsessive video on Dead Rising that's ever been made, so I might as well cover everything. Like all games to a greater or lesser degree, Dead Rising can be replayed, and I personally feel it has good replay value. Some achievements require basically a dedicated playthrough, like Saint, which requires rescuing all 45 optional survivors, Transmissionary, which requires getting every possible walkie-talkie call, Clove's Horse, try on all the outfits, and Frank the Pimp, which requires escorting 8 female survivors at once and no men, and to free up the mission log you need to go around killing all the male optional survivors to get it. Goddamn cultural Marxism strikes again. These are all a little finicky to complete, and I personally needed guides, but I enjoyed all of them. Slightly more boring is PP Collector, yes haha, silly name, which means you need to take photos of a hundred little stickers located throughout the game. Kind of lame, but it only takes about an hour, really. One achievement that's even more of a slog, but also rewards you with the best weapon in the game, is Zombie Genocider, which requires you to kill the entire population of Willamette. In case you forgot, that's 53,594 zombies. Obviously, trying to do this by hand is a hopeless proposition, so the run consists entirely of driving around the underground tunnels, periodically switching between vehicles as they get damaged, for about three real-world hours. Honestly, it doesn't require much concentration, so you can watch a movie or something while you go, but it's still kind of funny when you think about how stupid a waste of time it is. I'm not sure whether it's subversive in a society where everyone is expected to be rushing around and making the best use of their time 24 hours a day, or if it's just another manifestation of our increasingly nihilistic and pointless existences under late capitalism. Despite my protestations of Marxist enlightenment, I guess I must be as hopelessly addicted to my little signs of status as everyone else in society because I did it in 2006 and 2017. My reward was the Blue Bomber's Mega Buster, which I tried not to use too much on film since it would be boring to watch and it seems pretty cheap, but I'm going to take every advantage I can get in Infinity Mode. Essentially, it's a survival game where every NPC is hostile. Take that, you mute bastard! But more importantly, Frank loses health over time from hunger and needs to find food to survive in the mall for as long as possible. It's a fun little idea, and of course there are no more unlimited food pickups like in single player, so you have to hunt down each hidden morsel and take out everyone you meet to get their food. 
And of course, each time you get hit by zombies or survivors is going to cost you. There are two awards for surviving five and seven days in this mode, and one of them gets you the awesome laser sword, so an achievement hound like me is definitely going to go for it. I got some feedback saying that I went a little too easy on Paul in my analysis, but that sure isn't going to be a problem this time. Die, nerd! Oh, come on, I don't get the box if I make him drop a Molotov on himself. There's just one little problem with infinite mode, and that's that you can't save. Well, I mean, it sounds obvious, right? It's supposed to be a survival mode, but think about it. One day of game time is two hours, which means that seven day survivor requires you to play the game non-stop for 14 hours. You can't just leave the game running either since you have to keep Frank's health up and you have to constantly be finding more food. To make matters worse, the fact that food is so limited also means that if you're seriously going for the achievements, you can't really experiment or have any fun while playing. You have to use the most overpowered weapons like the Mega Buster and Mini Chainsaw constantly or risk losing too much health. Ha! Eat that, Steve Blum. How's that for a justifiable homicide? And if you thought of hiding out in the supermarket, don't bother because it's locked down. The other obvious choice is the food court, but there's a little problem there too. In the original version of the game, entering or leaving the food court at all on the fifth day would lead to a crash, and remember that five days means ten hours of real play. This leads me to believe that Capcom didn't even play their own infinity mode much, since this would be an easy to detect glitch, and it was never patched. This bug quickly became well known, but imagine being one of the first people to find out about it. Thankfully, it's fixed for the PC version. As of right now, the 5 and 7 day survival achievements are the only ones I haven't unlocked, and I don't know if I ever will. However, some people have been asking me if I want to do live streaming, so perhaps at one point if there's interest we can go through the pain together while I try to fail 14 hours with entertainment somehow. After all, it can't be worse than playing the same GoldenEye level for 40 hours straight, and apparently some people do that. Of course, every game gets old after a while, and there's only so much content there can be. Thankfully, Capcom decided to yeah. extend the game's lifespan a bit by including 12 items of DLC. Yeah. Unfortunately, they were all just recolored clothing items that Frank can get from the lockers in the security room. Yeah. Of course, I can't knock Capcom too much since they were all free, but yeah. sadly it seems like Dead Rising was simply their first piece of experimentation, yeah. since Capcom is now well known right. for selling costume DLC for their fighting games for up to $4 per right. outfit. On the subject of bad business practices, I wanted to address one right. issue that existed with the original game. Many people complained that the on-screen text dialogue, like Otis's walkie-talkie calls, were just too small and blurry to read on their standard definition TVs. Since HD TVs were just becoming semi-affordable for consumers and the game was optimised for them. Was this some sinister planned obsolescence ploy on Capcom's behalf? Now, I might have knocked Sargon earlier, but let it never be said that I'm not also a rational skeptic YouTuber, because we're going to test whether Capcom hated SDTVs experimentally. Okay, so there's an HDTV right next to you when you first start fighting zombies, and the SDTVs are laying in a warehouse in the corner, which certainly seems to indicate a preference, but we won't know for sure until we see how many zombies I can kill with each of them before it breaks. Okay, the HDTV is definitely taking an early lead, and it's cutting through that horde, but there's certainly something to be said for the extra weight of the cathode ray tube. That's definitely a satisfying impact. As for the real world, some gamers demanded a patch which never came, and there's no option to change the font size in the PC version either, though of course that's sort of a moot point nowadays. When there were similar complaints about the Lost Planet demo in 2007, however, Capcom did fix the problem before release. They weren't the only company to run afoul of this issue, and Ubisoft's 2005 Peter Jackson's King Kong on Xbox 360 was too dark to see in standard definition, since they had only tested it on an HD TV, and a patch was quickly rushed out. It's a good thing that studios would never make short-sighted mistakes and not test their games enough like that nowadays. Now, it's clear that the HD TV is killing quicker, which might be a reference to the blazing fast LED pixel illumination, or it might just be because the horde is much bigger and more aggressive in Entrance Plaza, who knows. The SD TV seems to be taking a more ponderous, slow and steady approach, which perhaps reflects its long history and enduring popularity among retro fans. Oh, but I think we have a verdict. The HD TV is in pieces are just 64 kills, with the SDTV still going strong. It lasted for 86 kills, enough that I got all the way to the end of Paradise Plaza and had to head back. I guess it's true what they say, they just don't make them like they used to. I think we can put that silly conspiracy to rest now. After 11 years of heated controversy, I can say scientifically that Capcom loves standard death after all.
Some people have asked what I think about the sequels to Dead Rising, and as far as I'm concerned, there's only one rightful sequel, and that's Dead Rising 2. It expanded on the concepts of the first, with better survivor AI, crafting, slightly better graphics, and online modes that were great fun. The story is a bit sillier in my opinion, but it still contains the political messages that I enjoyed so much, with more of a focus on reality TV and entertainment, plus evil corporations. Overall, it's definitely worth checking out, but I don't plan on making a video on it for a good long while. There are two other games which claim to be part of the series, but as far as I know, they're just examples of the general degeneration of the industry as a whole. I haven't played either of them, since I don't want to spoil my enjoyment of the series as a whole, but from what I understand, the third game is a somewhat dumber, more mass-market title with brown bloom graphics, with less creativity and effort, while still having some redeeming features while the fourth game is a complete flop that demonstrates a total tonal shift and most importantly a lack of effort compared to the care and artistry that went into Dead Rising. It's pretty stunning to me that a game released in 2016 can really have worse graphics than one from 2006 but Dead Rising 4 really looks abysmal. If you want to see why I encourage you to search up Crobe Cat's comparison video because I don't want to put a bad taste in my mouth by thinking about it anymore. But in all seriousness, no sequel could dampen my enjoyment of Dead Rising, which I believe is one of the greatest games of the Xbox 360 era. I'm sure my opinion on it is obvious by now, but to keep things consistent I'm going to rate it like the other games I've covered. In terms of gameplay and visuals, the clear technical skill involved in the production really shows in the final product. Unlike those who write Dead Rising off as a brainless gore fest, I think it's clear that a lot of effort was put in to make it a hard-hitting and satirical story piece just like the zombie movies it's inspired by, and that really shows in the cutscenes. Long before L.A. Noir, Dead Rising used full motion capture to portray on screen the emotion and energy of the script, and that's reflected in cutscenes that are full of dramatic weight. At the same time, the 360's hardware was put to the test by the demands of the gameplay portions which are a total joy to play, and the philosophy of freedom and player choice are fully realised. The hundreds of ways to dispatch the undead or other survivors of the Willamette Parkview Mall keep the game entertaining for dozens of hours, and the survivor rescues and psychopaths keep the game from being too easy. The game remains entertaining for multiple playthroughs, and even after up to 90 hours of play to produce this video and replaying some sections many times to capture what I wanted, I was rarely bored. With that said, there are some frustrations that I have to mention, like the awful survivor AI, bugs like the food court glitch, and the fact that the game sometimes leaves the player unsure what to do without a guide. In addition, the gorgeous wide open areas and density of zombies meant that the Xbox 360 version suffered from long load times, and the tiny text was annoying in the original release. Ultimately, I have to award the Xbox 360 version with a 9 out of 10, but with better load times, 60 frames per second, less bugs, and no issues with standard definition, the HD re-release deserves a perfect 10 out of 10 in my mind. If you don't feel that my analysis has spoiled it for you, and you enjoy the genre, I highly advise you to play Dead Rising and Dead Rising 2 on PC or Xbox One. Of course, we should also cover the subversiveness of Dead Rising's story and themes, and here too I think the game shines. I suppose I could dock a few points for the fact that his main message is essentially a retread of Dawn of the Dead, a movie that came out 39 years ago, but then again, those criticisms of consumerism apply just as well in 2017 as they did in 2006 and 1978, and that alone should make players think. In addition, the criticism is modernised by the War on Terror era script and the meat analogy is further explored. As a video game, it does what Dawn of the Dead never could and brings the player into the free roam consumerist playground personally. Of course, of course, the game needs to be understood in context to bring these themes across, and many who played it never received the social messages. I feel like making the satire any more blatant would ruin it for the rest of us though, and I think the parody is largely pitch perfect. At the end of the day, Dead Rising is only capable of critiquing capitalist culture and not of offering an alternative, but it could never really do that without becoming preachy. Overall, I'll grant it an 8 out of 10 in terms of subversive content, and it represents a highly underrated piece of social commentary in my opinion. I hope that you've agreed it was an interesting piece to cover, and most of all, I hope you've enjoyed my analysis. Thank you for sticking with me through some of the rough points and the general length, and I hope to see you in my upcoming videos, as well as hearing your feedback in my comment section or on social media. The best reward I could ever receive is a wide audience, and I encourage you to share my videos if you think you know someone who might be interested. But this is capitalism after all, and money is pretty nice too, so I give thanks to my $5 Patreon sponsor Jacob Barger for helping to support this video, and I always appreciate new patrons. If you're able to donate, the link is in the description. Thank you and see you next time. 
Oh god, I can't believe I wrote 16,650 words about a zombie game. What am I doing with my life? That's basically a dissertation. Well, at least the audience reaction makes it all worthwhile. <laughs> oh, Frank. Oh, Frank. How can you even show me crap like this? Oh, you know, I really don't think you're cut out for this. <laughs> oh, I can't stop laughing. 